Last week I preached on my favorite verse in the Bible. I know I say that about a lot of different verses, but this actually is it. John 15, 16, where Jesus said, You did not choose me, but I chose you. Appointed you to go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would endure, and then the Father will give you whatever you ask for in my name. Uh, I had fun last week. I don't know whether you did or not, but uh, I really enjoy preaching John 15, 16. But in that verse, Jesus confronts his disciples with the truth that they did not choose him, but he instead chose them. I think the importance of that is there because when you hear all of the promises that are offered to us in Christ, it's possible that one might start thinking the reason that you're getting all this good stuff is because you're smart enough, good enough, hardworking enough, deserving enough, whatever it might be. And it's for that reason that you're now in Christ. And Jesus, I believe, is clearly saying, no, that's not the case. You have these promises because I chose you. It's because I'm good that you're getting all these good things. Let me rehearse what we've learned in the promises of God from uh, in this passage already. I did this last week. I want to do it again. He's saying in this passage what we've already learned is that I love you and have lived, Jesus lived to serve them. He washed their feet, letting them know that the day would come when he would wash their souls clean. He told them that he was going to love them even though they were going to abandon him and betray him. He didn't want them to worry. In these last moments before the cross, he wasn't thinking about himself and the impact that or the, the, the physical suffering, the emotional suffering, the spiritual suffering that he was going through, he was thinking about them, and he didn't want them to be eat up with worry. So he said, listen, guys, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going ahead. And while you're here, know that I am going to be your way to get to that place. I'm going to be the revelation of truth for you. I've spent three and a half years with you, and I'll send my spirit back, and he'll reveal all truth to you. And in the process, I'm going to give you abundant life, life that is full of everything good that comes from God. And I'm going to make it so that obeying me and obeying the commands of God becomes a joy because I'm going to woo your heart into loving me. And I'm going to send you a helper, a helper who won't just be with you, but he's going to be in you. And with his help, you're going to do greater works than I even did when I was walking the earth. He said, I want to make sure that you are full of my joy. I'm going to make you a fruit-bearing branch that's drawing life from the vine. That's me. He's, he said that my father is going to personally get involved in your life as a vine dresser and make it possible for you to become increasingly better at bearing fruit. And furthermore, when you and I are living together through this life, I'm going to give you whatever your sanctified heart desires. When your heart is, is conformed to my will, I'm going to give you whatever you might ask for in my name. And to cap it all off, from this point forward, I'm not calling you my servants I am calling you my friends, and I'm going to lay my life down for you. And every last one of these things are true for all of us who are in Christ. But Jesus wants us to know that we have these things not because we're good, but because he is. Not because we chose him, but because he chose us. And so it's not a cause to get puffed up. It's actually a cause to be humbled and grateful. However, when you see a catalog of good things like this, and boy, this is, listen, all that stuff's really, really good news. And when you see a catalog of good things like that, it's easy to be led into believing that all of the Christian life is going to be gumdrops and daisies once you come to know Jesus. That once Jesus chooses you, Boy, it's all sunshine and days at the beach. Granted, I'm going to say this clearly. Life is better with Jesus. I want to say it again so that everybody hears it. Life is better with Jesus, always, in any circumstance. However, that doesn't mean that the Christian life is without struggle. This week's passage actually gives us some 
promises in addition to the ones we've already heard. These are promises that you might not have embroidered and framed and hanging on your walls. Promises that might not have prominent positions on your refrigerator as magnets. But they are promises nonetheless. He says that there are those who will hate you because he chose you. He says that you will be persecuted because he chose you. He says that some people will be so deceived that they'll think they're doing God a favor if they kill you. And through it all, the Spirit of God is going to be at work, and he might not deliver you from any of this, but instead he might supernaturally inspire you to bear witness in the midst of it. Well, hallelujah. Let's all shout. Praise God. We're going to be persecuted. Maybe we're going to be killed. Woohoo! Yeah, I know. Not so much a hallelujah thing, is it? But I pray that you can hear the word today. As I preach it, persecution is just as much a promise from Jesus as ask whatever you will in my name and I'll give it to you. And if you're going to claim one promise, you kind of got to claim both of them. And it's important that you embrace this as truth. Otherwise, and hear me, when the inevitable persecution does come, if you don't get this nailed down in your mind ahead of time, if you don't get this firm in your faith ahead of time that persecution is a part of the call, if you don't get it nailed down when the persecution actually comes, it may actually wreck your faith and cause you to stumble. And I don't want that to happen. And Jesus didn't want that to happen. So beginning in John chapter number 15, verse 18, I'm going to read all the way through chapter 16, first half of verse 4. Jesus says this, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. And whoever hates me hates my father also. And if I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they wouldn't be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said these things to you to keep you from falling away. They'll put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's doing an offering service to God. They will do things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I've said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Let's pray together. Lord, this is, um, this is a really hard word in our culture today. And I acknowledge that. 
but it's your word, it's truth. Pray today that you give me the ability to preach it with the anointing and that we might hear it with the anointing and that we might be glori- that we might glorify you in the process. May it be so in Jesus mighty name. Amen. Once again as he did in each of the passages in chapter 15, Jesus tells us very clearly at the end of the passage why he's sharing everything that he said in the passage beforehand. Verse 1 of chapter 16, Jesus says clearly, I have said these things to you to keep you from falling away. And again in verse 4, and when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. The falling away there that's mentioned in verse 1 of chapter 16 is the Greek word skandalizo. It's it's the word that describes a cause for stumbling. Uh, literally, it's describing the bait that exists in a trap. It's the thing that causes you to get snared. It's the thing that causes you to trip and fall. Jesus, in paraphrase, I would say that Jesus is saying this, you need to be prepared for this because when the day comes, I don't want you to think that the persecution is unusual. I don't want it to come to you unexpected. Don't think that God is failing you or that I've abandoned you. Don't think that just because persecution comes, it means that you're outside the Father's power or outside the Father's will. Because persecution for the name sake of Jesus is simply a part of of every true believer's journey. Now, I want to make a clear admission again. This is a hard word. And there's probably not anybody in here who had that as a part of their gospel presentation when they came to Christ. Believe in Jesus and repent. And oh, by the way, people may kill you for it, but come on down. But just as much as that might not look like the gospel call in our corner of the South, what about those who are coming to Jesus today in Syria or Pakistan or China or North Korea or San Francisco? or a liberal, liberal arts college? What about people who are coming to Christ in those places where it really is true that when Jesus calls a man, he bids him to come and die? And giving their life to Christ really might mean the giving of their life. Imagine looking at someone coming to Jesus in Islamabad, and trying to sell them the prosperity gospel. Come to Jesus and there'll be health and there'll be wealth, there'll be safety and there'll be comfort. If you come to Jesus, he'll make all your dreams come true. Come to Jesus so you can have a bigger house and you can have better clothes so that you can live without any troubles. Friend, that only works in America. Well, I pray you can hear this. This is a hard word, isn't it? I need to grin more while I'm saying it. It only works in America. You share that kind of gospel with people in China, and it would be a lie. And if they came to Jesus with that expectation that he was going to make all their dreams come true, They were going to get their wish list from him. It would definitely be a cause of stumbling when reality strikes. And it most definitely would. That's why Jesus is saying these things so clearly here. So that when persecution does come, you don't judge the gospel as a bait and switch offer and get offended and disillusioned or discouraged and fall away. 
Jesus hung on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins and to wipe them away and give you eternal life and the majority of the reward that any of us will experience will be in the life to come. Jesus will be with you. The Holy Spirit will strengthen you in the midst of all the struggle that exists here on this earth, but make no bones about it. The Lord may require your life. Try and sell that health and wealth thing to Paul in prison in Rome. Try to sell that prosperity gospel stuff to Peter, who's being crucified upside down. Peter, if you just had a little more faith, brother, this would not be happening to you. There's a Hebrew word for that. That's right, it's hogwash. Listen, I don't want to paint this picture that being in the faith demands that you're constantly suffering. That is not true either. But the thought that you can't be doing everything that God tells you to do, be filled with all the faith that's at your disposal, and be glorifying God with every ounce of your life, the thought that you can do that and avoid all the struggle is ridiculous because you can do all of that and be hated by this world. Hated to the point that they take your life. Okay, I'm not gonna get ahead of myself. This sermon is filled with great gospel promises and they are great, but it's also filled with this expectation that you're gonna be hated, persecuted, and potentially killed. Now you might say, why in the world would the world hate us? After all, and I want you to think about this with me. Christians build hospitals, send missionaries to treat the sick. We are by and large champions of human rights. We give generously to the poor. We establish homeless shelters, provide food pantries. We're, generally speaking, law-abiding citizens who pay our taxes and participate in government through election and as candidates, and we even pray for our leaders. Generally speaking, we're kind, we're welcoming, and we're respectful. Why would they hate us? Why would the world hate us? I think Jesus says it very clearly that they'll hate us because we love the one whom they hate. And it's a guilt by association. I want you to keep in mind that the world that Jesus is speaking here that would hate and kill these men that he's talking to right now were likely the religious leaders of Israel. These religious leaders of Israel who studied the scriptures and memorized them who lived, at least outwardly, by the letter of the law, that were looking for a Messiah. Now, granted, that Messiah didn't look like Jesus, but they were looking for a Messiah. And they did all of these things without really knowing the one true God whom the Scripture was pointing them toward. Verse 22 probably sums it up the best from this passage. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Jesus had confronted the religious leaders with how they had missed the mark and their lives and their religion was actually a sin against God. And rather than being convicted and repenting and embracing new life in Christ, they hated him for it. To the point of killing him on a cross, they hated him for it, and they hated the disciples by extension. And friend, it's really no different today, in, in, in spirit at least. People are not generally hated just for believing in God. I know there are a few militant atheists out there that are the exception, but by and large, 
People aren't hated for believing in God in our culture. People are not generally hated for their personal and private convictions about religion. You can believe whatever you want in your own heart, and most of the time people aren't going to get upset with you. But the very moment you show yourself to be a true ambassador of Christ, with a faith that won't stay cooped up behind the four walls of the church or the four walls of your house, and you become a proclaimer of the gospel, a seeker and representative of the one true God, a student of biblical truth with the Bible as your primary source of authority, as soon as you become a person who lives according to those convictions and who works and prays for culture to be conformed to God's design for the good of all humanity and for the glory of God, as soon as it happens, as soon as your faith begins to impact the world around you, I pray you can hear this like you have four ears. When you start living that way, regardless of how kind you are, and regardless of how polite you try to be, and respectful you strive after, and patient you are, if your life stands for the truth as it is revealed in Scripture, if you live out the gospel and announce the gospel, you will be labeled by some as hateful, intolerant, bigoted, racist, closed-minded, ignorant, judgmental, and various and other, I believe, misnomers. They'll label you, and the reason they want to label you is as soon as you label somebody, you can discount the entirety of that group. Well, they're this way. I don't have to listen to them. They want to turn you into some type of stereotype. Because when they do that, they don't have to take you as a person seriously because they've stereotyped you. And the primary reason that many people will do this is that your life stands as a testimony that convicts them of their sin. Friends, many times you don't have to say a word for people to be angered by your life. Because when you live out the truth, now hear me, God hadn't called us to be quiet all the time. But I, I will say that you don't have to say a word many times. The way you live your life will inspire some people to hatred. Because your life convicts them of their sin. And when someone is convicted and they refuse to repent, that conviction becomes condemnation. And that condemnation will be perceived as a personal attack. And you'll be hated for it. And they'll try to silence you by ostracizing you, by discrediting you, which are ways of taking away your voice when the laws of our land prevent them from taking your life. Now, I think in the course of all this, very few people who might hate you for your faith will openly say that they hate God. I hear this all the time. I don't, I don't hate Christianity, just, you know, Christians. I believe in God, but I just don't think that Christians represent him well. I you hear all of these things, but, but regardless of what the testimony of their mouth is, there are so many that resent God. They resent his existence, they resent his authority, and they resent his claim on their lives. They resent the fact that he is king and he doesn't share the throne. They resent the fact that he is the lawmaker who says this is right and that is wrong, and they resent the fact that he is the one true judge. They resent when he makes mandates, and we stand for them and proclaim them to be true, that 
He is the one true God, and there is no other God besides him. Listen, that'll start a fight. They resent the idea that they're sinners, just like you and I, and that they needed a Savior. They were not good on their own, and they needed a Savior. And the only Savior for sinners is Jesus Christ. You say, but some other religions, they speak well of Jesus. Islam says that Jesus is a really good prophet. He was not just a really good prophet. Minimizing who Jesus was is simply a polite way of hating him. Because what they declare with that is that Jesus did not even know who he was himself. When he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father except through me. In our day, as soon as you live out an ethic and let it be known that you believe that sexuality is reserved for one man and one woman inside the bonds of matrimony, here comes hatred. If you stand up and declare that drunkenness in all of its forms is a sin before a holy God, here comes acrimony. If you declare that the love of money really is the root of all evil, and it's not a purpose for which to live for that's worthy. When you stand up and say that there is a heaven to be gained and a hell to be shunned, and that hell is not God being unfair, it's actually God being just. Honestly, you know, even me saying this stuff in front of some of y'all this morning is making you nervous. If you declare the Word of God is the final authority for everything concerning faith and practice and our personal opinions apart from the Word of God are of little or no value... But wait a minute, what about what's truth to me? I have very little interest in what is truth to you. Because truth to you will be impacted by your circumstances. Truth to you will be impacted by what you eat or how much sleep you get. This is our basis of truth. You stand for that in this world, hatred will come. And there are many people who live quiet lives and obey the laws of the land and even go to church upon occasion, but they have made a God in their own image. And by doing so, they express the fact that they hate the God of the Bible, oftentimes without ever confessing it to be so. And they will hate you on account of that truth. You say, Pastor Brian, that's so unfair. There are good people who, you know, they just, you know. I think I can find many places throughout the Scripture where the Lord declares very bluntly stuff like, you're either for me or against me. And this middle ground of tolerance that our culture keeps longing to find does not exist in the Scripture. So many Christians have responded to the pressure of our culture and they have become what I would consider a moral pacifist, placating to the culture in order to survive with a false sense of safety. Christian chameleons who keep it all inside and change their color to acquiesce to their environment. The problem is, when you do that, 
you will inevitably not just acquiesce to the world, you'll be assimilated by it. And when that happens, it neuters us of the power of God. Because you and I who are in Christ, I shared it with you last week, we're called. We're called to be ambassadors, that we're here to represent Christ. We're heralds of the gospel. We're supposed to announce the gospel wherever we're at. We're called as missionaries, not to go around the world, but in our culture. You're a missionary, an agent of change that's been sent into your family, into your workplace, into the supermarket. And we've been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit for the solitary purpose of representing him in this world. There are a lot of tangent benefits associated to having the Spirit of God in our life, but you cannot separate it from its primary role. That the Spirit of God comes on us to empower us to represent Jesus in the world that we live in. We are light, and light is not supposed to be hidden. We are salt, but salt is of no value while it's still in the shaker. And even though there are those who will hate us for our lives, that we lived in submission to the will of God, hear me, in the midst of those who might hate us, well, I pray everybody can hear me when I say this. In the midst of those who might hate us, there are those that will be transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ and will become a worshiper of the living God as a consequence. We will endure hatred. We will endure persecution as good soldiers of the cross because we know that there are those around our lives right now that are waiting to hear the gospel from our lips. And when we announce it to them, whether we've just met them today or whether we've built relationship with them over the course of years, when you announce the gospel, the Spirit of God will come in and bring to life their dead spirit. The scales will fall from their eyes and they will be supernaturally translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. That which they once hated, they'll passionately fall in love with. And God called you to do that. That's who you're called to be. I feel the need to make a few disclaimers, though. <laughs> Paul told his godson Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse 13, it's Paul's last letter. It's his last words to Timothy. He said, all those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, who's got that on their fridge? I know. <laughs> Never seen that on a t-shirt or a bumper sticker. But it's truth. We endure truths like that because we want to see God glorified by people coming to Christ. Coming to Christ by our delivery of an unadulterated gospel, the gospel. And there are those who will hate us for it. Now, here are the disclaimers that I want to make. You are not suffering for Jesus' sake when people hate you for being a jerk. If you're just an ugly human being and people hate you, that's not suffering for Jesus. If people hate you because you're arrogant and you talk to people like they're stupid 
or you treat them like they're lesser than you, and you look down on them, that's not suffering for Jesus. If people hate you for being hypocritical, that you demand of other people what you don't demand of yourself, or you criticize others for certain things, straining at gnats in their life while swallowing camels when it comes to your own. That's not suffering for Jesus. If people hate you because you're unkind and grumpy, that's not suffering for Jesus. If people hate you because, you know, this is me. You might think all of these have described me up to this point, but this is the one that's really me. If people hate you because you love the truth more than you love people. Listen, I love the truth. I do. But I love people too. I've had to grow in that. And if I announce truth to you and I do it passionately, here really is my underlying motivation. I'm not trying to get stoned and I'm not trying to make you mad. But but I do want you to hear because I am utterly convinced that the truth is what is best for you in every real way. It might not be what's easiest for you. It might not be what's most expedient for you. But it is best for you. And I'm passionate about that. I just have to make sure that my passion for the truth doesn't, get way out in front of my love for people. That's how Jesus could be standing and have a bunch of religious folks usher up to him a woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. And while they are wanting to tell Jesus the details and know, so that he knows everything that's going on so they can try and trap him with some legal loophole from the Mosaic law. Listen, Jesus knew that the accusation was true, but in that moment, he was more concerned about that woman than the truth that these men were trying to expose her on. But don't misunderstand. He didn't look at her and say, honey, it's okay. That's not what he said. He looked at her and said, I'm not going to accuse you, but you go and you sin no more. I love you, but I love truth too. If they hate you because you just love truth, that's what I find in a lot of the pundits of the talking heads that you see on television. They just love their opinion and their truth. They don't seem to love people. It's not very attractive. It's not suffering for Jesus if they hate you for that. It's not suffering for Jesus if they hate you for misrepresenting the truth or being unable to defend it because you can prepare. You can read the Scripture, study the Scripture, know the Scripture. The Spirit of God that inspired the writing of this book also lives within you, and you can comprehend and retain and learn. And so if they hate you because you misspeak and misrepresent and are unable to defend, that's not suffering for Jesus. It's not suffering for Jesus when you experience bad consequences for bad actions. If you do something bad and there's a bad consequence associated to it, that's not suffering for Jesus. That's actually the law of sowing and reaping at work in your life. Or so often I'll hear people say, oh, I'm just suffering for Jesus in this, you know, because I'm going through this, when it's obvious that you can trace what they're going through now directly back to something they did that they ought not do. That's not suffering for Jesus. It's not suffering for Jesus when you're judged guilty for having bad associations. We need to be careful who we identify with. Before I go endorsing somebody that may line up with me on one little area, (laughs) I'm going to make sure that I have real, like, precious faith with them. Bad associations 
will cause people to hate you, and that's not suffering for Jesus. If you just live a morally corrupt life and people wind up detesting you for it, that's not suffering for Jesus. Hear me, all of these things are character flaws that need to be repented of and they weaken your witness and they strengthen the purposes of the enemy in the earth. They're not suffering for Jesus. They're God trying to stir you up towards something better. But having said all those, when you do take a stand for Jesus and all the love and power that the Holy Spirit has called you to, if you do it in the workplace, if you do it on campus, if you do it with your family, if you do it wherever you're at in our culture, it will inevitably cause offense. It will. There is no way you can live the Christian life without causing someone offense. Now, we don't want to see anybody get offended because of those bad actions that I just talked about a few minutes ago. But they're, if they're offended because of the truth. And you know, offending people is like one of the great cultural sins in America right now. You shouldn't say that because when you say that, it offends me. It kills, it kills the possibility of discourse. Somebody, this is one of those things that annoys me, so I want to be careful I don't preach about it too hard. <laughs> like you said that, and that offends me, as if that's a moral sin or a mortal sin. When you talk about your priorities and your opinions, they make me feel bad about who I'm choosing to be. Again, that's one of my pet peeves, so I'm not going to talk a whole lot about it. But I pray that you can hear me very clearly. The gospel of Jesus Christ, when it's preached with all the love of Christ and under the power of the Holy Spirit, is offensive to people many times. How do I know it was offensive? They killed Jesus for it. They killed almost all of these men that he's talking to for it. There are thousands upon thousands that were killed in the first century church alone. And all the way up until today, there are people all around this world that are literally being killed. They're losing their life for nothing more than the truth of the gospel. There will be people who hate you for doing nothing more than what Jesus called you to do. I would say again, make sure that they're hating you for the right reasons, not the character flaws I mentioned earlier. But when that happens, here's what I believe that you can expect. When you're hated for his name's sake, I think you can expect that the Holy Spirit will empower you to do amazing things in those moments. Things that will usher in the kingdom of God and bring glory to God. That will bring people to Christ, though it might possibly bring you face to face with Jesus. I, re I was reading a couple of weeks ago, actually, uh, on this subject, and I came across this story that I hadn't heard for years and years, but it really struck me. In 1553, the daughter of Henry VIII, historically she's known as Bloody Mary. She came to power in England, and Mary was determined to bring the Roman Catholic Church back to England that had gone England had gone through its own Protestant Reformation, but she was 
convicted. She was set on bringing the Roman Catholic Church back. She forced Parliament in 1553 to repeal everything her brother Edward had done and return England under the regency of the papacy. And persecution during those days was very intense and martyrdom was very frequent. More than 300 people died in those years publicly for their Protestant faith. A few of them, Hugh Latimer, Nicholas Ridley, and Thomas Cranmer. Latimer and, Rid and Ridley were ordered to be executed, executed outside the city gates at Oxford. And as they were being led there, they were led past the prison where Thomas Cranmer, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, was jailed. They were hoping that they could catch a glimpse of him so that they could shout out encouragements to him and, and, and inspire him to be steadfast in the faith. And indeed, Cranmer was brought to the tower of the prison by the government so that he could watch the proceedings because they were trying to get him to recant. Their aim was to frighten him. And, and when Cramner was overheard during that time as he watched his brothers burned at the stake, he was heard to be languishing and sobbing. They put Ridley and Latimer to the stake. Latimer looked at his friend and said, Master Ridley, play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England that I trust it shall never be put out. It's quite the testimony when you're about to be burned alive. Latimer died somewhat quickly. Ridley's brother-in-law tried to hasten his death by making the fire larger, and he actually only, he, he smothered the fire in the process, and it caused Ridley to have to suffer for a very, very long time. And Cranmer was within shouting distance, listening to all of it. Hear me, these men were murdered publicly for nothing other than an adherence to New Testament Christianity. They were killed by the church and by the government for it. Well, it affected Cranmer. He was treated harshly in prison and eventually had what many called a brainwashing experience. And he signed four articles recanting his Protestant faith. However, Mary, Queen Mary did not want to excuse him. And even though he should have been released after he wrote the, after he, he recanted, she wanted to make an example of him. And so she brought him before the court on a day when he was supposed to be executed, and she gave him one last opportunity to confess his sins before the people. And Cranmer came convicted by the Holy Spirit. He became overwhelmed by what had happened in the days previous, and he thought of his friends. And he got up and rather than recanting, he, he got up and he bore testimony to the one true gospel. And he, he declared that his faith was in Christ and Christ alone. He preached a gospel to that room that was similar, and reminiscent of that which Luther and Calvin and Zwingli had preached in years gone by. And when he, when he was in the throes of it, they came up and they grabbed him and they rushed him out into the courtyard and they... They tied him to the stake and they built a fire out of, and he, his, his, 
His response in that moment was to say, this was the hand that signed those papers and it will burn first. And he took his hand and he stuck it out into the fire in front of God and everybody. And as he was dying, he was heard to quote the words of Stephen. I see the Son of God standing at the right hand of him in glory. And he died. So that's not a very happy ending to any of those stories, Pastor Brian. It is said that Thomas Cranmer's heart did not burn in the fire. And they found it in the ashes unscathed. The church, the Roman church, they said, must have been because his heart was so wicked, the fire couldn't touch it. It must have been because his heart was deformed so bad that the fire couldn't affect it. I think it's a confirmation that it wouldn't burn in this life and it didn't burn in the life that was to come. It's very unlikely that any of us in this room are ever going to be put to the stake. This is what will happen to us. It may cost us a job. It may cost us part of our reputation. It may cost us some acclaim. It might cost us some popularity. It might cost us some respect from people we probably shouldn't be too concerned about respecting us. It might cost us some money. It might cost us some comfort. But I wonder in the face of that, would we not let the Holy Spirit inspire us to have the same kind of passion that those men faced on that day when they looked out into the fires? The same kind of passion that caused Paul I hope this is true. It's not Bible, but it's history. It says that he led his executioner to Christ before the man killed him by chopping off his head. And so given, honestly, the somewhat tame hatred that we might face, I wonder... Would you be willing to stand for truth in the midst of being ostracized and be a light for the gospel? Would you refuse to cheat on your taxes and be a light for the gospel? Would you refuse to lie for someone else and be a light for the gospel? Refuse to be silent in the face of the kind of errors that lead other people astray? Would you be a light for the gospel? Would you refuse to go along with friends who would lead you into sin even though they might laugh at you and they might leave you and they might hate you in the aftermath? Would you refuse to cheat your boss out of an honest day's work to be a light for the gospel? Would you refuse to condone people's wickedness with your silence even though others might laugh? Would you refuse to be silent when the gospel needs to be announced and refuse to acquiesce to the culture's demands and instead stand for truth and God's glory? If you do, let me promise you something. Suffering will come. In our culture, if you can live your entire life with no one hating you for your faith, it's probably evidence that you have a very well-hidden faith. Because he made promises. You will suffer persecution for my name's sake. Paul told Timothy, all those 
who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You should expect it to come. Now hear me. Don't be shocked when it does. Don't let it break your faith. Don't let it cause you to stumble. Jesus wanted you to know ahead of time that it would come. But here's what you can't expect. Is that in those moments... I believe that there are special dispensations, special touches of the Holy Spirit that come on us in the midst of suffering for his name's sake so that we might bring greater glory. You say, well, I want the Holy Spirit to come on me and deliver me from the suffering. He might. He might. There are times when people were crushing in on Jesus, seeking to kill him, and it just said, and he passed right through the multitude. It's like the power of God came on him and just set him right free. But the day may come when it gets real. When that day comes, don't think that God's left you. You're being given an opportunity. An opportunity to have a megaphone. You didn't know who Latimer and Ridley and Cranmer maybe even were. But here we are, 500 years later, I'm talking about them still. There's history and books written about the stand they made for Christ. Who knows what the Holy Spirit might inspire of you as well. Let's bow our heads together. Lord, as I've prayed about this, I've, I feel like you have shared and just directed me to pray for those that they're just not standing up for you as they ought to. They're, they're kind of hiding their faith. They're being, they've compartmentalized their faith. They'll show it here on a Sunday morning around a group of Christians in a group or in certain arenas, but then they go off into other places and they just, they just don't. For fear of this or for fear of that, Lord, I pray that the spirit of the living God would come on one and all. And we, we repent where we have just fallen short. But we ask that the spirit would give us the boldness that we need. And that beginning today, we would be a voice we would be a light that shines. We would be salt that seasons and brings savor to the world around us. That we would be ambassadors that want to be used to transform our culture. Lord, use us. What Isaiah said before you, here am I, Lord, send me. Lord, I know that we probably will never go to the stake but the things that scare us are still real. Just help us to realize that your spirit will be there to strengthen us, to inspire us, to guide us. And there's miraculous things that you have when we obey. So I speak courage boldness, confidence, all in you. And I ask it in Jesus' mighty name.